What do you do if you have a patient with a really hot tooth and you just can't get them numb? Do you just keep giving them more anesthetic? Do you bring them back a different day? Or do you just refer them out? Let's talk about it. Hey guys, my name is Dr. Amanpreet Singh and welcome back to Dental Secrets. We've all been there. We're doing an extraction, the patient has a huge infection, and we just can't get them numb. What do you do? Now, we all know how to numb our patients. We learned it in our first year of dental school. You just put topical, you aspirate, and you inject slowly, right? Now, I know most of the time we can get our patients numb, but I'm just talking about that 2% of the time where our patients are just being really difficult. You tried all your tricks and techniques that you learned on YouTube, but nothing's working. So first, let's go over some reasons why patients don't get numb in the first place. The first and most obvious reason I can think of is an infection. If a tooth has an infection, there's a couple things going on. The first thing is your body is vasodilating the area, meaning it's bringing more blood supply, bringing more immune cells to actually fight that infection. And what happens is when you put your anesthetic, it's supposed to be converted to a, an active form. It's not active right away. So when you have an increased blood supply like a tooth that has an infection does, your anesthetic is being drawn away from that site before it even has a chance to get activated. And the other reason your anesthetic does not work when you have an infection is because your anesthetic only gets activated in a certain pH range. And when you have an infection, that site is generally more acidic, meaning less of your anesthetic molecules are going to get converted, and you're going to have a harder time getting that patient numb. So what do you do? How do you combat this? Well, there's a couple things you can do. The first solution is to just give more anesthetic. Instead of giving one carp of lidocaine, just give two or three. This will work as long as you're not concerned with how much epinephrine you're giving the patient. If a patient has a heart condition like atrial fibrillation, you probably want to switch over to an anesthetic that has no epinephrine. And another thing you can do is instead of doing local infiltration, you can switch to doing a block. So let's say I'm working on number 14. Instead of just doing local infiltration around the tooth, I can switch over to doing a PSA and an MSA block. And instead of just doing the local infiltration where the anesthetic is, you're actually injecting the anesthetic away from the infection. Now let's say you're doing an extraction and none of these techniques so far have worked. There's a couple more tricks that I like to try. One thing I like to do is to use a stronger anesthetic. So instead of using lidocaine for local infiltration, I can switch over to septicane, which is a stronger local anesthetic. I found that septicane works really well when I'm struggling getting patients numb with just lidocaine. Now there are a couple drawbacks to septicane. One is it doesn't last as long, so you're probably going to have to check in on your patient throughout the procedure and make sure they're not feeling anything, and you're probably going to have to give them more anesthetic if they are. And another drawback is I would not recommend doing a block with septicane. There's a few articles showing that if you use septicane during an IAN block, patients have a very severe reaction and they have a lot of pain for many months after. I know it's rare, and I know a lot of people have success doing it, I just wouldn't recommend it, and I know I can probably get the same result with doing lidocaine for a block, so I just wouldn't take the risk. Now, let's say there's no infection. Let's say the tooth is completely fine, but you're still not getting the tooth numb. Let's say you're just doing a filling. Your patient could just be metabolizing the anesthetic way more and way faster than the average patient. Your patient just could have a higher tolerance. So what do you do in this case? I would say the same thing as before. Just give them more anesthetic, more carps, switch to septicane, just know that, again, it doesn't last as long, so you probably have to check on them throughout the procedure. And again, if you're using too much epinephrine, you can switch over to another anesthetic that has no epinephrine. Now, another issue you could be running into is you could just be missing entirely. And this is really common in the lower molars if you're doing an IAN block. This is definitely the most common area to miss when you're doing a dental injection. And from my experience, the anatomy here is very different from patient to patient. So what are you actually aiming for when doing an IAN? So you want to numb the inferior alveolar nerve before it enters the mandibular foramen. So when you're aiming for this mandibular foramen, one of the things that I was taught and that helps me a lot is you want to aim a little too high or a little too posteriorly. And the reason is, let's say you aim too high and this is your foramen. You're going to let gravity do the work. If you let the patient sit for about five minutes, that anesthetic should trickle down and make its way to that foramen and effectively numb that inferior alveolar nerve. So let's say this patient still is a numb after five minutes. I would just do the same block again. I have pretty good success when doing the same block two or even three times. There is some research out there where if you do an IAN block and you combine it with a gout gates, you get a higher percent chance that the patient's gonna get numb. I don't really find the need to do this. I feel like I have pretty good success with just doing an IAN block alone. But if you have tried this technique of combining the IAN with the gout gates, let us know in the comment section below. And again, I would never use septicane when doing this block. I know it may sound enticing just because you really want to get that patient numb, 
But there's really no need for it. If you put lidocaine in the right spot and you get the nerve, you're, you're going to get the tooth numb. And when doing an IAN, I've heard mixed things about using a long needle versus a short needle. I know in school we're taught to use a long needle for this. But what I've seen is people have some pretty good success with just using a short needle. And one of the reasons people like short needles better for an IAN is you have a lower risk of getting facial nerve palsy. And really that, that becomes more of a risk if you go to the hub with the long needle. Me personally, I just use a long needle, but I just make sure I don't go to the hub and I get pretty good success with that. But if you have a different technique, let us know in the comments. And I wanted to go back to the point of numbing a tooth. So let's say you tried all these techniques, you're doing an extraction, and the patient's still in a lot of pain. One of my last resorts that I like to do is anterior ligament and papilla infiltration. Actually, a lot of times I just do this stuff before I even start an extraction. I don't want the patient to feel any pain. So what you do is you take the anesthetic syringe and you put it into the PDL of a tooth and you go all the way around the tooth and inject some of that anesthetic. What I found is this works really well and the patient is numb right away. The only problem is this doesn't last that long. So after you do it, you want to make sure you start working right away and don't waste any time. And with the papilla infiltration, the same thing, you just, let's say you're working on number 30, you want to go in the papilla mesial to it and the papilla distal to it and just inject until you see some blanching in the papilla. That's how you know if you have enough anesthetic in there. Another thing I've heard really good things about is an intraosseous injection. I don't typically do this because you actually have to drill into the bone and I feel like I haven't really had the need to do that. But I've heard really good things about this. So if you do intraosseous injection, I want to hear about it. Let us know in the comments section below. Thank you guys for watching. And if you liked the video, make sure you hit that thumbs up button and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. And we'll see you in the next video.